Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship with Grace United Church. And a warm welcome to our extended community joining us online on Zoom. And if you can find me in the Zoom room, uh, this is uh, everybody that's kind of here. You can maybe get a look at their, their faces. So it's, it's imperfect, but we're, we're, we're trying our best and, and we're seeing what we can do to keep, keep people uh, connected. And, and welcome to uh, those of you that are joining us, uh, tuning in later on, on YouTube. My name is Kenji Marui. Uh, my personal pronouns are he and him. And it's my, my honor and privilege to be with you in this time of worship. Uh, one month in with you, and uh, the training wheels are off. Pat is on holidays. I know he, he's doing stuff at the back there, but he is on holidays, and so it is just me. So I, I bear full responsibility for what you are about to experience, and I apologize in advance. Uh, the visuals on the screen will not be exactly what you have been used to seeing, because uh, I'm not up on Prezi and and overlaying and, and, and graphic, all of that sort of stuff. But we will muddle through. We will somehow manage to worship God to offer our praise in these strange and challenging times. So with that being said, a few things to note for those of us in person in the moment here. Uh, we will be remaining in our seats with our masks on. Uh, we won't be singing the hymns today, but, but Jamie will sing on our behalf and feel free to, to hum along. Uh, no children's programming quite yet, uh, so kids, uh, wherever you are, you're, you're staying put. Uh, sanctuary washrooms are the only ones uh, that are available if needed over the course of this morning. And at the end of the service, please stagger your exit with the back pews leaving first, uh, and exiting the building through the parking lot doors and into the rain. Uh, sorry, but can't control the weather, but we, we do have to try and, and keep uh, uh, to limit the, the, the amount of time that we spend in close proximity indoors uh, with people. So that's part of what the new reality is. If you uh, read through the announcement, uh, the, the email that Lori sends out on Friday, you'll see little reminders of uh, calendars and, and for next year, church calendars for next year and poinsettias uh, coming up for Advent. And uh, I forgot to mention this last week, but uh, this week I do, I do want to thank the uh, Sanctuary Guild uh, for all the work that they put into decorating the sanctuary. And uh, I know Remembrance Sunday was last week, but Remembrance, I, I think, is a fitting theme for this coming week that is Trans Awareness Week. It culminates with Friday, November the 20th, being the National Transgender Day of Remembrance. Grace United Church is an affirming ministry of the United Church of Canada, offering welcome and sanctuary to any and all gender expressions and sexual orientations. We aim to be an inclusive, intergenerational community partner. The name of the church is Grace. There is a theological concept called grace that is uh, the anti-karma, if you will. Like, if karma is you get what you deserve, grace is the notion that we can receive what we receive is beyond anything that we could possibly do to deserve. That grace and God's blessing uh, and God's love is infinitely more than what we could hope to earn or receive by merit. By, by what we do. And so it's uh, very fitting, I think, that a church would name itself grace after this sense of gift and blessing uh, given to us regardless of who we are, where we might be in life, and that uh, it, it's, it's free for us to accept and live into. I would also like to acknowledge that the land upon which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples, specifically Amjanong First Nation. The Three Fires Confederacy between Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi organized uh, the, the very complicated and intertwined relationships between these people as well as with the Lene Lenape and the Haudenosaunee. And so with great gratitude for this wider understanding of who we are, we prepare our spirits for this time together. Our worship begins with music speaking to our hearts. In the prelude, may the Holy Spirit 
our, be our comforter, Christ our redeemer, God our creator. May they all hear our praises. So come, share the joy of the Lord, delight in God's goodness. Praise God who gives each person a special gift to be nurtured and shared, and we give thanks for these gifts. Come, let us worship God who entrusts us with so much, and we hope that we might remember that we are worthy and deserving of such love and trust in us. Amen. Are gathering songs. Oh. 
And so just because we can't shake hands and hug and, and be close to each other does not mean that we can't greet one another with kindness and well wishes. From a distance, through technology, let us share in sending one another the spirit of care and comfort. So we'll give you a bit of time to make eye contact, to wave. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe do a quick pan with my phone so the people online can see who's here. and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll figure this out. So my question for this swell time of connecting with the kids that might be uh, tuning in, what does Jesus look like? That's, a, that's kind of a loaded question. I mean, if we go to the next slide, we'll see. What we are used to seeing, uh, Jesus with a, a fair complexion and, and a glowing radiance um, you know what? I've, I've got a friend here who, who's kind of an expert on what Jesus looks like. Um, so I'll just, uh, he's a little shy, needs a little bit of encouragement. But uh, I think, and this is a strange new place for him, but I, I think, I think we'll, we'll manage. Um, we can get to, yeah, I guess the camera back on, on the pulpit so that everyone can meet, meet my friend. <laughs> this is Jesus, and you can see he's obeying the, uh, the public health protocols. <laughs> um, well, I think, yeah, and actually, if I have mine on, then I'm the best ventriloquist ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I can get this, and if I'm covered, then Jesus, you, you can... Uh, there we go. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here with you at Grace United Church in Sarnia. Although technically I'm kind of everywhere all the time, but I'm happy to be here with you. Is this what you were expecting to see? Usually, Jesus is a little more groomed. <laughs> but my uh, quarantine beard has been a little, uh, gone a little crazy. Over, over the years, many artists have tried to depict me in the way that they kind of see 
how I should be. And so if we're back to the slides, you'll see that rendition of, well, one of me is looking very thoughtful. Another one of me is, uh, is holding scripture and offering a blessing. But the historical me in the next slide is a reconstruction of what a 30-year-old Israelite man in that part of the world at that time in history would look like. He could use some grooming as well. <laughs> but that's probably the closest picture of what Jesus would look like. Next one. But it doesn't prevent people from trying to imagine Jesus as they need to see Jesus. So Jesus with black skin. Because if God came to humanity for the sake of all of us and took on human form, then skin color it doesn't have to be limiting to any particular expression or race, such as black Jesus or the next one, uh, the, the work of Hei Ki, a Chinese artist who sees a little bit of himself in Jesus. Or the next one. Or an indigenous representation of what Christ would be. Or famously and controversially, the crucified woman at Emmanuel College in Toronto. That helps, I think, Imagining Jesus in different shapes, in different forms, helps us remember that no one has a monopoly on the Savior, and that we can expand our, our minds, our thoughts, our ideas of what, what it means to follow in the gospel way and the gospel truth, and we need input and ideas from all kinds of experiences and representations and interpretations to get the closest to where God might want us to be. So the next slide will show you, oh yes, and uh, the Simpsons Jesus, who like every other character has three fingers on his hand. <laughs> next is, uh, there's, there's what I want us to think about. We see Jesus when we look in the mirror. What does that do for us? What does that do for our faith? If we can see within ourselves the heart of love and giving and, and, and sacrifice for justice and care for all, uh, of being inclusive, of being intergenerational, being in partnership with others, then I think that's a good place to begin. A good place to continue our journey of faith together. Very happy to meet all of you. Look forward to seeing more of you in person at some time. And uh, I usually spend myself on top of the bookcase uh, in Kenji's office these days. So if you want to visit, pop on by, be happy to chat. Okay, wow. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. We'll have you. You can uh, sit there. <laughs> His posture is not ideal, but uh, he has been working long hours this week. We will hear later in Scripture of how God invests in those who follow in faith. God blesses them in abundance and, and with great gifts and trusts them to do what's right and assumes the best, reserving judgment and evaluation until after. We respond with our best efforts, investing our time and talents in the expression of ministry here at Grace. And we've made offerings in person, by mail, e-transfer, and pre-authorized remittances, and we make offerings when we call one another, when we pray for one another, when we 
serve on committees, when we contribute to the well-being of the community. We respond to God's abundance, and we seek to make the most of what we have, and we plan for the best, and we leave judgment and evaluation for a greater wisdom than ours. And so it is in this moment that uh, we acknowledge and give thanks uh, for what we give that is but God's own. pray. Now in these moments of gratitude, we would offer you a portion of all which you have given us, gracious God. We do so trusting that you will take what we give and multiply it for your kingdom so that all might be blessed by your love, your peace, and your hope. Amen.
Thank you, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Sam. In the scripture reading, Jesus often spoke in parables to give real-life examples of what the kingdom of God was like. Here he shares how the faithful might respond to great gifts of abundance during times of absence and uncertainty. Good morning. The scripture reading this morning is from Matthew 24 verses 15 to 30. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, one, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them, and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trusty slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. 
and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, so take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For, for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of Christ. May God bless the reading to our understanding. Amen. Thank you, Joanna. Let us pray. Holy God, we give thanks for the talents that we possess, for the gifts that we have, for the blessings that we have received. We pray that we might work to further the work of your gospel, good news, of your love and care in this world through what we do and the, the people that we support and the work that is done. This morning we ask that the prayers that we pray, the songs that we, that we hear and sing to ourselves, and the words that we uh, say and hear be blessed by you, O oh God, our strength, our refuge, and our redeemer. Amen. March 15th of this year marked the onset of COVID-19 shutdowns and quarantine measures. Social distancing changed from a philosophical concept to a protocol of public health and safety. We learned how to wash our hands properly. We hoarded toilet paper and sanitizer. We figured it might last until Easter, hmm. until Victoria Day, until summer. We learned how to wear face masks properly. We watched for updates, we wondered how long this would last, and we waited for light at the end of the tunnel. Eight months later, eight months later, we are still watching news updates, wondering how long this will last, waiting for some sign of hope. The outlook is even more dire, if that's possible. Infection rates are higher than they've ever been. Conspiracy theories and champions of personal freedom undermine public health measures. Hospital ICUs are filling to capacity. Greater restrictions have yet to be imposed upon Sarnia Lambton, but for how much longer? The uncertainty of the situation and the clash of competing viewpoints has been very wearying. My partner Shelley observed that we've all been grieving the loss of normalcy for the past eight months with all the stages ping-ponging between denial and anger and bargaining and depression and acceptance. For many of us, the most troubling aspect is the unknown timeline, the incalculable end of the pandemic. If we knew how much longer this would last, well, we could plan accordingly. We could pace ourselves. We could get ready for the future. Except we, we can't do any of this because we don't know the end date. So we live in this uneasy, uncertain, in-between existence that has us all anxious and exhausted. But these are not unprecedented times. We have been through this before. Not many of us remain from the Spanish flu outbreak 100 years ago, but we did survive that as a collective society. More recently, there was SARS. Our daughter was born during that epidemic. Earlier still, remember the, the fear-mongering and, and the stories spread about HIV and AIDS? As a civilization, we've been through all of this before. And going back even farther, our Christian faith was born in a terrifying and troublesome time of uncertainty and anxiety. 
Jesus lived among us, teaching and healing and preaching in a time characterized by oppression and intimidation by a domineering military force. When religious and government officials conspired to eliminate the threat he represented, he rose from the grave, leaving an empty tomb and reimagining the cross as a sign and symbol of new life, of new hope, and of a new world. He ascended beyond this earthly existence to return to God's abiding presence with the promise that he would return again to complete the work of renewing and reconciling all creation to the new life, to the new hope, and the new world that was promised. Matthew wrote his gospel during this anxious time of waiting for Jesus to return. The promise of his second coming was the only hope that the early church had during the unprecedented, uncertain, challenging time of persecution and punishment within Roman society. Those who claimed Christ as Lord were committing treason and heresy because only the Caesar of the Roman Empire could be considered Lord and divine. To believe otherwise was illegal and immoral and punishable by death. Times were bleak and dire for the faithful to Christ. They, they faced torture and martyrdom every time they prayed, every time they gathered for worship. They kept their faith quiet and, and confidential, fearful that they may be betrayed by friends or family, arrested and executed. In a time of upheaval and persecution, the early church eagerly awaited the second coming of Christ, the promised restoration of God's kingdom to reward their faith and to restore their fortune. Except they did not know the timing of his glorious return. There was no save the date invitation. There was no definitive deadline. There was no expiration period for the uncertain in between anxious waiting. They could not plan accordingly. They could not pace themselves. They could not get ready for the future. While this morning's parable of the talents preaches patience and participation, uplifts investment and initiative, the parable also explains how to live in such times of uncertainty. The master of a household is going away for an extended and unknown period of time. As was common practice, workers were entrusted with the estate assets, divided among many so as to reduce risk of embezzlement. A talent, as described here, is a unit of currency. Now, depending on which website or, or research article you consult, one talent is the equivalent in silver that an ordinary adult man could manage to carry, likely about 50 pounds, which translates to an average of 8,000 days wages, a lifetime of earnings in one talent. And given today's minimum wage, we're looking at millions of dollars that the master entrusts to the slaves. What happens next is not proof that God loves capitalism or that God endorses a free market economy. While heavenly reward and esteem appear to be measured by return on investment and profits realized, the lesson is about engaging in life being present and active in the world, in the here and now, and not about waiting in fear and trepidation over an uncertain future, but about exploring and pursuing opportunity in the present. Evaluating their ministry by the numbers, by the money, is misleading and dangerous. The first two slaves put that money to work, used it in the moment, those first two slaves were able to enter into the joy of their master. They proved to be good and trustworthy stewards of these assets, and they reaped the reward. Their response signals an understanding that God's kingdom is born out of extravagant abundance and generous grace. Facing a long period of absence and inactivity, of watching and waiting and not knowing, they responded with trust and hope for the future and actively worked to advance their master's fortune. By contrast, the third slave is motivated either by sloth or by fear. He is unwilling to risk any action and hides the talent where it was safe from loss and depreciation, but also unable to provide any benefit. 
While the master berated uh, this third slave for being lazy, one biblical scholar did observe that, that, that burying so much money in the ground for safekeeping is a lot more labor-intensive than merely taking it to the bankers. So not lazy, but afraid. He was playing it safe, preserving the principle and eliminating any semblance of risk. He operated in this overly cautious manner because of his impression of the master. To his mind, the master was an exacting tyrant that would punish any loss. The dominant narrative tainted by scarcity and thrift, by pettiness and penny-pinching. His fear kept him from doing anything with what he was given. He ended up with nothing, cast aside far from the joy of his master. The parable of the talents demonstrates the power of perception and attitude. If we expect that God is cheap and harsh and to be feared, we discover God treats us that way. If we expect that God is generous and gracious and loving, we discover that God treats us that way. The self-fulfilling nature of our relationship with the divine, positive or negative, explains why some churches obsess about sin and punishment and the need for, for forgiveness at all times, and why other churches focus on grace and mercy and the need to work for justice for all peoples. The slaves in the story experienced a master of their own making, of, of their own design, which is why it's important to explore and seek out a variety of images and understandings of what Jesus looks like, of, of who God is, of how the Spirit is present in the world. The more intensely that we look into the mirror only, the more strongly we construct a faith relationship that is self-limiting and self-isolating. On this day, the Ides of November, November 15th, 2020, we are 245 days into this pandemic life. We face an impending lockdown. And the people, we, are puzzled and perplexed, impatient and agitated. Who knows when this will end? How much longer? Maybe, maybe Jesus will return and put things right in the meantime. Does, does anybody know? Well, because of this experience, we have an inkling of what the first followers of Jesus lived. As the early church struggled and strived in anxious waiting for the second coming of Christ for a definitive answer and an ending, we can appreciate such unsettling, uncertain in-between times. And in response, we can be like the first two slaves— they acted. They made a difference in the world. They were not paralyzed by fear. They saw the possibilities of what could be, and they found great and joyous reward. That is our path forward through this confining COVID challenge, to risk, explore, and live out our faith with self-fulfilling expectations of goodness, hope, and generosity. And, and by washing our hands, of course. Amen. And so we are invited to receive God's blessing and God's treasure and, and, and talents and, and to seek above all things uh, the path to gospel goodness, grace, love, and care.
And let us pray. Wise and patient God, our mother, our parent, creator of all, we know what you want us to do, but we are far too often hesitant to follow through for you. You give us multiple blessings and ask that we develop these gifts, use them to help others. In times of great crisis, we come through and we mobilize. But in the intermediate times, we hold back. We develop a let someone else do it attitude. We often think of our gifts, our talents, as things that are less than worthy. In this country in which competition is the ruling code, we don't want to compete with others because we feel we just don't have the right stuff. How blind we are, Lord. To each one of us, you have given gifts which can be used to help others. Each gift and talent is precious in your sight. Rather than compete with others to see who has the greater talent, let us use the gifts we have been given joyfully. One of the greatest gifts is this gift of prayer. We have brought before you, O oh God, the concerns which are weighing on our hearts. Touch the lives of all these people and situations with your healing love. So we pray for Bernice's family, for Charlie, for Nancy, for Adam, for the Solano family, for Margaret, for Dolphine, for Lori. We pray for Gloria, Doug and Ev, Stacy, Rob and family, Elizabeth, Sarah. We pray for Carol, Andy, Teresa, Daniel, Elizabeth, Betty, Aaliyah, Mateo, Helen, Joy. Loving God, give each one of us a sense of your powerful presence. Flood our lives with hope and peace. Help each one of us to be workers for you. Help us to trust in your abiding presence and love for us. And challenge us to use the gifts and to offer the giver. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, praying with the words he taught us to use. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
So thank you, Jamie, for joining us. Thank you, Glenn, for leading us. Thank you, Sam, for your musical contribution. And Eli, making things happen in the back there. And thanks to Pat on holidays, overseeing it all. And thanks to all of you for being here in this time together. Let us go forth to be God's faithful servants. We will not hide our gifts, but share them with everyone we meet. Let us go forth to be the followers of Jesus. We will not hold back our compassion, but offer it to all. Let us go forth to be the Spirit's hope and peace. We will be the grace and joy and wonder that others need in their lives. Amen. Let us live so God can use us.